Lace them up, let's start the show. We're digging in with Trish. We're digging in with Trish. We're digging in with Trish. We're digging in with Trip. We're digging in with Trip today. Yeah. Welcome to another edition of Digging In. Momentarily, we're going to grab our shovels and, boy, enjoy really going deep with, well, you look at the 2003 first round uh, and really the entire draft will go down already, and certainly history will be kind to it as one of the truly elite drafts in National Hockey League history. And this guy has had as good of a career as anybody, and he's still going from that draft, Eric Stahl. I remember meeting him as a teenager. Um, if he's been tremendous, consistent, durable, he's dug in throughout his career on the ice in Carolina, uh, briefly with the Rangers, Minnesota, and now Buffalo. Trust me when I say he is an infinitely more genuine, selfless, difference-making person off the ice. So I think you're really going to enjoy this one with Eric Stahl. And I'll get into why I have him in my cell phone and always have from early in his career as Mr. GQ. Uh, we are presented, as always, by our longtime sponsor, the New Country Auto Group, newcountry.com. Uh, check every box when it comes to what you'd ever want from an automotive group. You're talking about uh, the upper echelon of automotive manufacturers um, on planet Earth when it comes to Mercedes, Lexus, BMW, Maserati, Ferrari, smart car, etc. Uh, with dealerships spanning uh, throughout New York, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Maryland, and Florida. Family-owned, family-run, salt-of-the-earth elite automotive group, newcountry.com. Before we dig in with Eric Stahl, I want to remind you and encourage you to rate and review uh, our podcast on all audio platforms as well as YouTube. Ask any questions that are on your mind. We will do our very best to not only answer them for you, but improve upon whatever feedback you present. Um, I encourage you as well to check out digintrip.com. Our merchandise is ever evolving. I have bias, but I think it's pretty darn cool. Um, whether it be hats, regulars, truckers, uh, winter hats, with or without balls, hoodies, uh, the list goes on and on. Digintrip.com. So without further ado, let's really get knee deep with a great hurricane, a great National Hockey Leaguer, and he is still going very, very strong, and I hope he will continue to do so. I'd never bet against this guy on or off the ice, and if you ever need, if you're a friend in need, he ain't a pest. He's the antithesis of that. Let's grab our shovels and welcome in Eric Stahl. I don't know as I welcome my very special guest, former Hurricane captain and Stanley Cup champion, Eric, Mr. GQ Stahl. I'll get to the GQ portion in a minute. I think on television, the only player, and this is not with shovel in hand, that I had tears in my eyes when he got traded right before a game against St. Louis to the New York Rangers. Um, that's how much he means to me, but let's get to what this thing's all about. Eric, uh, as we start every show, how do you define digging in? Oh, digging in, man. That means uh, coming to work and doing uh, all you can to help your squad or your job or whatever you're doing uh, have the ability to, to accomplish your goal, I think. Uh, digging in means um, you're all in with with whatever the goal is and, and you're committed fully. And I think uh, there's different moments when everybody needs to dig in, whether it be in life or uh, without it, within a game. And, and uh, the more people you can surround yourself with that are willing to do that, uh, the more success you're going to have or, and the more uh, enjoyment you're going to going to have for sure. You mentioned, uh, you know, Part of uh, your digging and definition is is setting goals and chasing them. At what age, uh, partner, do you think you first uh, had a goal to make the NHL? Um, I mean, I, I mean, I think I always dreamed of of uh, of wanting to make the NHL, but I just never really even 
thought it was going to be a reality. I think as a kid, you're, you, you, <clears throat> you play the game because you love it. And I think, uh, I just enjoyed, uh, you know, being at the rink, being uh, on the outdoor ice, uh, just just loving the game. Always dreamed of playing in the NHL, but never really had a thought of um, of it of it actually happening. And I, I think until I probably was drafted and and ended up uh, going to Peterborough was kind of when I first uh, first had a moment where I can I can make this uh, a reality. And, and I think that's kind of uh, you know, when I realized I would be able to try and try and make it a dream come true. Boy, I think about, because I'm going to jump around in this one. Um, I remember when you made the team and you had to earn your spot on the team as a teenager. It's your first game in Florida. Your first game was on the road in yeah, Florida. Yeah. What do you remember about that first game? Um, I mean, I, I remember a lot of the guys just saying, enjoy it, um, have fun. You no, know, um, I, I remember Luongo was a net for them. I, I remember I had, I had a scoring chance. I, I think one decent chance um, that game and Luongo made a great, you know, kind of a high blocker save on me. And, um, you know, I, I, I think my only, my only goal was to try and, um, you know, be a contributor on our group and, and just uh, not screw up. I mean, I think as a young guy, you're, you're just out there, your, your eyes are open and you're, watching so much of what everyone else is doing, but uh, you're also um, just just reacting and playing with instinct. So I, I, I tried to do that. Uh, you know, I, a lot of it was a blur, but I do remember having one pretty good chance on Luongo, but, uh, you know, he was uh, at the top of his game at that time. And, um, but, uh, you know, a fun game moment I'll remember for forever. Oh, a goaltender. We, we ended up losing. <laughs> I think we lost, I think we lost three, two. I think it was a score. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure on that, but I, we we didn't win. I know that. Well, I can tell you, it, you, you talk about that matchup with uh, Roberto Luongo, who you eventually won a gold medal with in Vancouver in the Olympics on home soil, and then you came home, and I did an interview. I met your mom and dad for the first time. It's between the first and second period, I believe it, and it was with Jared your youngest brother, it's the only time I, I'm no longer, but it's the only time based on how old would he have been that I was taller than a stall. <laughs> he would have been, uh, Oh, so I was probably, I was eight, 19. So he would have been yeah 13, maybe something like that. Six years younger. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. He, uh, uh he, he's grown a little since then, but yeah, <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> it was, a spe I can remember it, uh, the interview vividly. Um, and, and speaking of Florida, uh, one of your agents, longtime agents, is now an assistant general manager in Florida, Paul Jerry Maguire Kripelka. And this was early in your career, and he lived in Boston, and he wanted me to ask you this. I talked to him today. We were at a restaurant, you, Jerry Maguire, Maguire Kripelka, Cam Ward, who he also represented with Bobby Orr and Rick Curran. And you looked at the menu. You were just getting acclimated with the, the restaurants around the league. I know where you're headed with this. And you looked at me, <laughs> you looked at me and you go before we were going to, they were rushing us to order a little bit, Italian restaurant. And you said, Trip, what are shit take mushrooms? And, <laughs> and it's everything that's great and genuine and salt to the earth about and mushrooms, shit take or shiitake come from the earth. So, Paul Kropelka wanted me to ask you, because I told you, I told him we were digging in. Does Buffalo have good shit take mushrooms? I uh, I haven't had the benefit of eating out at a restaurant yet because everything's closed, but I'm sure I could probably find a spot that uh, uh, that probably has has some good ones. I mean, you gotta you gotta remember, I'm I was 18, 19 years old. I grew up, you know, small town farming kid, and I mean that's kind of the language that's used a little bit on a farm. Um, you know, that's what cows do. So, I, I mean, when I, I think I must've been at first glance and you must've made me feel real comfortable being able to ask you that question. And obviously, uh, Paul would, would, was the same. I was comfortable asking him things. So, um, I'll, I'll never forget that too. It was, <laughs> it was pretty funny, funny moment. I think you guys are both on the ground laughing, but, uh, uh, I wasn't worried about it. So it's, uh, 
I still uh, on occasion enjoy a little bit of shiitake mushroom on, on a steak once in a while. Well, for whatever reason, we hit it off right from the get-go and we had that trust. And before we get into the serious content, um, I, I want to now explain why you're in my cell phone, have been forever, is Mr. GQ. So you win the Stanley Cup, you lead the playoffs in scoring, uh, you get over 100 points the regular season. Remember, we were in Boston, we went to Florida, and GQ, the magazine, had asked you to do a spread. And, you know, again, from Thunder Bay, I mean, Tom Brady had just done something with, I think, holding on to donkeys. And, and I remember you said, Tripp, will you come with me? You know, because it was a little bit out of your comfort zone. What do you remember about that GQ shoot? It was, it made enough of an impression on me. I, since then, I call you Mr. GQ. <laughs> uh, it was one of those things that, um, you know, when they, when they had asked me, um, you know, through my agent to do it, I was like hesitant. And I was like, ah, you know, since when does GQ ever ask you to, you to do something? And you'd say no. So I was like, okay, I went along with it. And yeah, I needed some company. I needed someone to, to, to guide the way. So you were nice enough to come along, but man, was that an experience that, uh, that whole day, the photographer, the different photos, like, I, like I've, I mean, it put in perspective, maybe some of the, those shoots that some of those people do, like the, the model shoots and all that, like doing that day, like that guy had me. Yeah. I, I think I held, I did hold uh, a dog in a pool. I, I th there was so many shots uh, and photos that day. And I think they ended up using two, two for pages and, and two that were like, do we really have to use those two pictures? But it, I mean, it was, it was an experience and I can always say that um, I did it and, I was in GQ magazine, which is hilarious, but, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a, it was a fun day. That's for sure. Well, I don't know. I think they might ask you, uh, for a return visit because <laughs> you, you don't age. And now, uh, for those watching on YouTube, um, you're, you're letting the, you, you've never looked more Dutch. What, what's with this decision to let the, you know, the, the blonde follicles really flow. Well, it's COVID times, man. Like, I don't know. I don't, I just, you know, I've been locked away for a while and, and there's not a lot open. And then to do the salon thing, you got to wear a mask. You got to do that whole deal. So I just was like, man, I'll just let it ride. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's been, it's been, it's been going for a while, but, uh, at some point when I go a couple of games here without any, any goals, I'll, I'll just come back and I'll have no hair. And that's, uh, that's how it'll go. Well, guess what, uh, GQ. Uh, as we tape this, you're going to play in Philadelphia tomorrow. And I'm going on the board right now saying GQ is finding the back of the net. And historically, I've had decent feel about that. Um, let's, let's talk about um, the regular season before the Stanley Cup year, 2005-2006. Eric, why was your line with Corey Stillman and Eric Cole, I mean, one of the true electrifying lines in the national hockey league in the last 20 years. Well, I mean, I think it was a combination of a lot of different things, but I, I think for, for one, the way that we played as a team and then our line as well, uh, the pace and the speed, it just wasn't uh, done yet. And it was coming off the full year lockout and, and the game had changed. The rules had changed. And I just think the, uh, the, the amount of speed and, and offensive attack that uh, our team in, in general, but also our line especially played with, um, you know, teams just weren't really ready for that and weren't set for that type of defense. So um, we skated, um, we skated fast, we skated hard. And Corey, you know, was a big part of that with his experience and, um, you know, coming off, uh, you know, winning a cup in Tampa and, 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 you know, being like one of the top scorers in the league that year, um, you know, it just kind of made, I think, it easier for Eric Cole and I. Um, and, and they were just, you know, all power, all speed out of Colsey and then, and then great smarts and, and good plays out of Corey. And I kind of just kind of fit in with Bull. So it was, uh, you know, definitely a fun line, one of the funner lines I've ever played on. Um, but uh, I think just – coming out of that lockout and the new rules and the way that our team was playing, I think defenses just weren't kind of ready for that type of game yet. Boy, were you guys fun to watch dominating. One more question about Corey Stillman, because 
well, he's getting a lot of mention, Paul Kropelka, uh, <laughs> and he, he represented him. Technically, it was Rick Curran, one of your agents who handled, handled Corey Stillman. But we were in Florida before a morning skate, and I was having breakfast with Paul, and he looks over at Stillman, doesn't know who he is, and he's got his Boston accent. And he goes, my real name, Emmett. He goes, hey, Emmett, who's the substitute school teacher? <laughs> it was Corey Stillman. I mean, he didn't, and now coaching in Arizona, he didn't look like a national leaguer. Why did he see the ice so well? Back-to-back -back Stanley Cup champion. He predicted you guys would win the Cup. Game one in Tampa, banner raising, uh, by the way. Why was he just an elite playmaker like he was and put his line mates in a position to play to their strengths? Yeah, well, I think that's what he did. I think he put whoever he played with to, to be at their strength. And I think that's what, what made him so good was, was his knowing on uh, what he needed to do to help his line mates have success and, and be successful and be put in right spots. I think his natural instinct offensively was, was, you know, just in the right spots, obviously he preferred to pass before shoot, but, uh, but he could do both. And, um, you know, for, for me as a young guy, then uh, to play with someone like that, it just kind of, uh, I think opened up the game and, and opened up, uh, you know, my mind offensively as well. And, um, you know, a, a, a fun guy to, to be around uh, day in and day out. He always uh, he's had a little growl most mornings, but uh, it was always in good fun. And, and uh, you know, I enjoyed playing with Corey. He was a great player. You know, and he had those white socks, you know, before he, before he put his gear on, in, you know, before practice, he not necessarily style. He was going to be in GQ. I mean, he, <laughs> he looked like AC green playing for the Lakers. Um, it, if you had to, I was, you know, I, I always think about, we've talked about game three in Montreal and Rod ties it late. And then you score in overtime, you're down to nothing to Montreal. But if you, I mean, you led the playoffs in scoring. If you had to think of one moment in any series on the ice, in the locker room, between games, that you thought you, you as a group were at a crossroads and you had to, to dig in, what would it be? Well, I mean, I do think that that, that game three in Montreal was, was a pretty big crossroad dig in moment for our group. Um, you know, I just think that we had such a phenomenal year. We had such a fun year. We had um, such a year that, nobody wanted it to end and it, we knew if you let game three slip away it was going to be pretty difficult to to be able to you know come back and especially you know against a good Montreal team in yeah. in their building and and uh so I I think that that moment for sure was a dig in moment for all of us it was like um we need this game and obviously <laughs> It was really, really tight, you know, Roddy tying it up and then and then being able to to get it done in the power play in overtime. Um, I think from then just that momentum just completely shifted and, and maybe it was still tight and it was still tough the rest of that series. But I think maybe we played a little more free and a little bit more our style. And, um, you know, we just kind of kept going from there. The goal itself. Uh, on the power play, a tremendous gondola hanging over television booth. John Forsen and I uh, having the luxury of, I remember John saying it's a series now. Um, did you, were you just firing it at the net there uh, right in the middle of the ice uh, up high? Did you see something? Uh, Cristobal UA being the Montreal goaltender. Uh, well, we had, uh, we had their, one of their four checkers, I believe lost his stick. So the, the puck um, we had moved the puck around the top a couple of times, I think, we went through the seam once and then it was kind of a, a quick pass by Hetty back to the top. And he, it, he kind of laid it a little bit, little bit in front of me to one time it, but I figured, you know, I, I knew there was a screen, a good screen in front and, and a lot of bodies. So I, I was like, I gotta, I'm going to shoot this anyway. And um, you know, I, I didn't exactly pick a corner, but I did want to elevate it. And Fortunately, it was uh, right in the exact spot to, to miss everybody and, and get by him and in. So uh, that was a fun one for sure. And in that building and, and at that time for our group and our team, um, you know, it was a, a moment I'll never forget for sure. Colossal moment. Um, the finals against Edmonton, a good Edmonton team. And my gosh, was Chris Pronger playing at an elite level. Um, either when they 
came back to make it 3-3 or any other point, a private moment with your team for you individually? Because I remember being with Corey Stoneman at one point in Edmonton saying, we got to get our stud going. And that was you. And you then you were outstanding in Edmonton in game four, the one game you needed to win in Edmonton. Is there one moment that jumps out at you as a turning point in the actual finals? Um, you know, I remember, I, I believe it was before game seven, Roddy, Roddy spoke to the team. And whenever Roddy talked, and he didn't talk a lot, but whenever he did, man, he, he was phenomenal. I mean, I know um, he's a head coach now, and he probably has to talk a lot more than than uh, he, he would or did as a captain, as a player. But, um, you know, he, he, he's one of those guys that knows the right thing to say. And I, I, I just remember, you know, as a young guy, just it was one of those times where this moment can't pass us by without grabbing it and, and, and taking hold and, and knowing that this has got to be our destiny. And, um, you know, it was uh, – I think after he had spoke, it was just one of those things that uh, we all knew what we what we were going to do and what we were going to accomplish, and and uh, you know we took it all individually. But uh, I think as a group, we all collectively you know put the the extra effort in and and dug in together to be able to uh, you know to to come away with that championship. GQ, I'd like to think I'm a more seasoned analyst now than I was then. I was just looking at for the upteenth time. Willie, Justin Williams, empty netter in game seven. And you made a great play. Who was pinching down and and you held on to the puck for a split second extra. That thing could have been a nervous hot potato. And if, if I was calling the game, I wasn't calling it then. It was the finals national rights holders. What do you remember about that play? Because if I'd like to think if I had my A-level analysis, I would have really hit on that. That was a really subtle, pivotal part of that empty netter. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a couple of good plays. Actually, I actually think Brett Hedekin made a really good play uh, out of that moment too. I, I don't know if he he ended up actually knocking. I think they're trying to get it down low, and I don't know if he knocked it out of the air or if he just picked it off. But he made a a great play down low, and then he was able to get it up the boards to me. And then yeah, I, I you know, I had enough. Uh, I don't know. I guess at the time, confidence to him to make kind of a drag inside play instead of just shoveling it up the boards when. Sometimes uh, when you're nervous or when you're not as confident, you do. But um, in that moment, I, I was able to pull it in and I knew Willie was coming across. So able to find him and, and kind of uh, ice it. I'll, I'll never forget that, him skating up the ice uh, towards that empty net. And I, I think I was already celebrating before he had even actually shot it in the net. I was jumping up and down. But, uh, you know, great memories and great, uh, great moment to, to be a part of. I want to... I want to move forward to, again, now we did get to call this game in New Jersey in um, 2009, first round. Uh, you, uh, Yoni to UC, and, you know, everybody thinks it's going to overtime. And you know, one of your Olympic teammates as well in Vancouver and Marty Broder. One would always say this is your spot. This is Eric Stahl's, you know, this, this is his garden spot. Take us back. When you were coming down less than a minute left on Marty Broder, what you felt, what you saw, how you delivered the goods. Well, I mean, that that whole series I, I can remember vividly. It was it was tough. There wasn't a lot of room. And I I, I mean it, I'm used to being able to come through the neutral zone with some speed and you know carry the puck a little bit more. And that whole I mean, for whatever reason, well, or not for whatever reason, because of how they play defensively, they're a tough team. There just wasn't a lot of room. And I, I remember that whole series, you know, really having to grind for offense and grind for chances. And, um, you know, once we tied it up, uh, we I remember jumping over the board boards and, and saying to, to Rosie, I, I mean, I don't know how, I mean, I guess subconsciously maybe a little bit, but I said, let's just end this now. And, and uh, we end up, coming around the ice and then went D to D up to Chad. And I had, I had a lot of speed coming through the neutral zone and I hadn't really felt that much speed that whole series. And, and that, you know, that freedom of no one kind of right on top of me. And I ended up picking the puck up and kind of came across the blue and I had a lot more time and, and room than I had in pretty much that whole series. And I was able to, to put a good shot on Marty and, uh, you know, kind of stunned him and, and, uh, 
a pretty cool moment to, to be able to be a part of that with, uh, with our group, uh, you know, going from thinking you're going to be losing and the season being over to, you know, completely flip the script to moving on to the next round. So uh, it, was, it was a fun, fun goal for sure. Did, did you tell me and fact check me if I'm wrong, GQ, that did, did that puck flutter on you a bit or did you, did you actually, did you hit your location? Did you miss your location? And did you ever talk to Marty Brodeur about it? Uh, no, I hit my location on that one, but I've, I've, I've missed my location on Marty many a time. And that's usually the only way you score on him because he's such a phenomenal puck reader and game reader. When, when you play against Marty Brodeur that he kind of knew where you were shooting before you even shot. So whenever I normally played against him, if I kind of missed my shot or, or put it where, you know, put it somewhere else rather than where I wanted to, it, it had a better chance of going in with, uh, with on Marty, but on that one, um, I know the D man was kind of coming across, but I, I got all, everything on that on that shot and put it exactly where I wanted to put it. But um, their D man might have got in the way of it a little bit. But um, you know, it, the only mention he he made to me um, about that was uh, actually at the Olympics in Vancouver. I'll remember he he probably doesn't, but we were going into overtime or against. Uh, against the um the americans in the finals and we were like walking out on the ice and he he uh made a comment like uh what it was something like some someone find a way to get this get this goal or or get the job done just like like kind of like you did salty like kind of one of those things just remembering back on the the goal against against them in that series so um but (laughs) it kind of gave me a little extra jolt. Maybe that's what I needed. Um, obviously it wasn't me I ended up cashing in in overtime, but, um, you know, I think that that little, little comment was a good confidence boost, uh, for me. And, um, you know, it was, it was fun to be part of that team with, with a hall of famer guy like that. Classy moment for him because he had lost his starting job to Luongo, uh, you know, in route to, uh, that gold medal game. And, you were the X factor. Ken Hitchcock still talks about it against the Russians. All right. Bottom line is you don't even get there. You were so good against the Russian, but the goal in game seven against Jersey, I have to ask because this is such a privilege that I have having been the hurricanes analyst for so long. And I, I, I have many weaknesses, but I do have an elephant like memory. As soon as Jordan scored your brother in game seven, same spot, same location on Braden Holpe to tie that game before Brock McGinn scored a couple overtimes later. Where were you? Did you immediately think about your goal? <laughs> um, I don't remember where I actually was, uh, but I do remember thinking thinking about my goal and and uh, you know the fact that he's in a hurricane sweater and scoring a goal, kind of exact same spot, exact same style. Um, and then obviously, you know, seeing, um, some side-by-side videos of both of us shooting kind of the same, same type of shot, um, you know, later the next day, I think, or next day or two after, but, uh, um, you know, fun to, fun to, to look back and remember on moments like that and, and fun to watch, uh, you know, your brother kind of succeed and, and, um, be important in, in those types of moments too. I want to let's stick with your uh, your brothers because family is everything with a capital E uh, for you. So let's start uh, age wise. You're the oldest. Let's start with Mark. Um, tell me how and why or what defines Mark when adversity has hit him and digging in. What uh, how is Mark dug in, in an inspirational way for you as a brother? Oh, uh, well, I, I mean, he's had a few different moments for sure of, of having to dig in career wise. Uh, you know, one uh, for me, uh, the first time would have, would be um, me involved with it. Uh, we, we played against each other on a regular basis. Um, you know, Mark was an elite defender, very tough to play against when, when, uh, when the Rangers were really good. And we saw them regularly and, and we battled. We, we had some nights where we battled hard. We battled a lot. He'd, he'd have better games and I would have better games, kind of went back and forth. And, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, the, the, the one year, um, 
I caught him with a hit and caught him really good. And, and he ended up getting a concussion and, uh, it was tough. It was tough to, to know that I, I was the one that had, you know, done that to him and, and I wanted it to take it back. I regretted it. And, and I think, you know, watching what he went through and watching how he reacted and responded to it really was, um, I don't know. It was just one of those things that I, I think as brothers, you just, you know, you just cherish and, 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 um, and love. It was, it was tough, but he, you know, immediately was like, Nope, that's fine. Uh, I forgive you. Like it's, it's not a big deal. It's part of the game, but he, he had to deal with a lot. It was tough. It was, it was really a long time till he came back um back to 100 percent, and he missed the i think the first half of that next season and he struggled over the summer with with headaches so um you know all because of of uh of me and him playing hard against each other but um that's always the way we had been that's how we had been growing up and and you know we respected each other's game and respected each other so much that um you know going through that was tough together but the way he acted and, and treated me and his response, um, you know, is something that, um, you know, I think means a lot and, and kind of shows a lot and shows the type of person that he is. And, um, you know, and then obviously also he, he's had a horrific eye injury that, uh, he's had to deal with, um, taking a, you know, slap shot off a deflection right in the, right in the eye. And he's went through a lot with that and, and battle back and, um, you know, I, I think there's been plenty of moments where um, over his career that he's, you know, gotten back up after being knocked down. And, and uh, it's really been, you know, as an older brother, proud to see and uh, inspirational. He's, uh, you know, he's a, he's a person that uh, you look up to for some of those things, for sure. Oh, that's powerful. Um, you know, and as you know, um, Mark and Jordan were we're on digging in right before the hurricanes and the, the Rangers uh, teed off in the bubble. And they talked about uh, his eye injury and you were with Jordan uh, as hurricane teammates. When you found out about it, I believe it was, mm -hmm. might've even been Ron Francis who told you you were with Jordan, Jordan, same question to you about uh, Jordan. Oh, well, Jordan. Um, well, he's, yeah, he's had a couple, couple tough injuries that uh, he's really had to, he's had to dig in to, to get himself back as well. And, and, and one was with the hurricanes when uh, he broke his leg in preseason. I think we were super excited for the year to start. He was going to be a big, big part of our, our season. And, and, you know, it's uh, such an unfortunate thing when, when you see him go down um, in a preseason game and, and it's as, it's as bad as, as it was, um, you know, it was, it was really, really tough to see. And, um, I, I, I just couldn't, I, re, I remember going into the dressing room, you know, after he had, he had broke his leg and he's in, he, he got himself off the ice and he was taking his basically his legs dangling and he's taking all his gear off and he, he, he didn't even flinch with, with like, like I'd have been scrubbing, like laying on the, eye. I'd been like curled up, like I'd have been done, but he was just like, you know, gritting his teeth and you could tell he was in so much pain, but like you did, you couldn't even, you couldn't even tell at all. And it was amazing to me. Uh, but he, uh, yeah, he got it all fixed up and then he ended up coming back halfway through the season. But by that time it was, I think we were in a dog fight. It was really tough for him to kind of catch the 40 game into the season um, uh, movement. And, and it was difficult, but um, you know, that time watching him, you know, come back from that was, uh, was huge. And, um, also in the playoffs, he, he, he had his foot cut, uh, the top of his foot, um, by, uh, PK Subban, I think, um, one of the series against Pittsburgh. And, and so they, it was pretty bad. It cut the tendon right down to his toe and they had to, you know, fix him up. And, and he ended up, they were like, Oh no, you, 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 you can go, but they did surgery wrapped him and they said you should be able to play it won't wreck again so we played the next the next day the next game and of course it that was not the case and it wrecked again and and then uh he ended up having to have surgery again and then he ended up with an infection so he was 
grinding. I think he, I don't even know how many surgeries he had on that foot, but it was a lot. And, um, you know, watching him go through that was tough, but, um, you know, seeing him on the other side and how much, um, you know, he kept it together was impressive. And, um, but those are, you know, parts of, you know, playing the game for as long as we have. And, and, um, you know, I've been fortunate to, uh, you know, to be able to do this with alongside or, or against and this job kind of with those two guys. And they've, uh, they've meant a lot, um, to me and, and, um, made a big impact on, on, on my career as well. Your youngest brother, Jared, uh, certainly a finalist, I would say, with Mark uh, as being the funniest in the family. Um, I will never forget having the ability to call a game. And unfortunately, Mark was hurt. It was against the Rangers, where all three of you, you and Jordan and Jared, started on the line as Hurricanes. Um, he's now doing a terrific job coaching uh, in Orlando. Same question about Jared. Well, I mean, I think for, for Jared – to me as an, as the oldest brother and, and, you know, making, you know, first making, you know, to junior hockey, then making it to the NHL, um, you know, then having success, winning a Stanley cup, um, you know, all those things early in my career, you know, Jared was, you know, the youngest of four of us. And I, I just think that the amount of pressure and the amount of attention and eyes uh, that got put on him was probably unfairly. And, and uh, that can be difficult, but I, I've never met anybody that that has handled it, you know, as as well as as he has. Um, just always, um, always a, a great spirit. Always a, a guy that uh, you want to be around. He's always in in a in a mood that um, builds you up. And um, you know, those are infectious type people. And and uh, he's dealt with a lot of. Uh, ups and downs throughout his, you know, playing career. And, and then now obviously he's getting into coaching, but um, I'd never heard a teammate that he's had over his time that did not like playing with Jared Stahl. He was one of those guys that you love to have in your dressing room and you love to, to, uh, to be around um, a real true glue guy, as you could say. And uh, he, uh, you know, he's obviously now staying in the game love and coaching and um, it's going to be fun to see him kind of develop in that role because uh, he's got a great mind for the game. He's, he sees the ice. He's, he's smart. And, um, you know, if he puts the, the work in, I'm sure, um, you know, he'll continue to move up the ranks in that field. Absolutely. <clears throat> it, whether it be hockey or another sport with the achievement class, never losing your roots, genuine salt of the earth nature. Eric, is there another um, couple of brothers that uh, have made it either in hockey or another major sport that you look at and you say, wow, I like those guys. And if yes, why? Um, well, I mean, I think, I think the Manning brothers, I, I, I respect those two guys. I mean, I think one, both phenomenal players, um, both, um, you know, champs, both won Super Bowls. But I, I just think the, the way they conducted themselves, the way they, you know, spoke to the media, the way that they carry themselves. I mean, I don't know either of them personally, but I think just, you know, watching them from afar and, and uh, knowing that they, you know, had each other. Obviously, their dad played as well, but, um, you know, a lot of respect for, you know, for those two brothers and, and uh, um, those are guys that, uh, you know, I thought were tremendous for, for the sport and, and just carried themselves the right way. And I think that's, you know, kind of how, you know, I want to be, and, and I, I know my brothers as well want to be is, is, you know, carry yourself in the right way, be, be respectful, be a great teammate. And, and, um, you know, usually if that's the case, uh, you know, good things follow. And um, for us, you know, Careers are going by fast, but um, we've had a ton of great things that have happened and hopefully, uh, you know, some more to follow to, to finish up. Absolutely. And the class, like the Mannings, has been steady and constant and unwavering. Um, I remember, I think it was a practice day, might have been a morning skate. Beautiful hotel in Vancouver called the Pan Pacific. I mean, you won't have a better view outside the hotel. And we were waiting for the bus. 
and your contract was coming up, you know, either that year or concluding the next year. And I said, I turned to you, I said, GQ, Eric, I, I really want to be your analyst for your entire career. I want you to be a guy that, you know, began with the hurricanes, ended with the hurricanes. And I know how badly you, I mean, you wanted that so badly. Um, how difficult was that? And I was just talking to Jordan before we, we started taping and, you know, we're, with all the rough years, then you end up having to move on. I know you got to play with Mark and with the Rangers briefly, but that's right when I know Hannafin's no longer on Carolina, but that's right when Pesci came, Slavin came, you could see things really progressing. I know it's the last thing you ever wanted. How hard was that? Oh, that was it was it was really hard. Probably harder than than um well, I don't even know if I could say it's harder than I thought, but it, it, it was really hard because, um, you know, you know, as a player and as, you know, how, how I've always been was, you know, you're in a place and that's where you are and you don't, uh, you know, I, obviously that's pretty naive to think like that. You know, professional sports is a lot different, but, um, you know, as a kid growing up in a small town, you, you end up on a team and, and they want you and you want them and you're, you're all in, you're invested. And, and, um, uh, that's, that's how I was. That's, that's, um, uh, you know, my mindset every day was, was trying to, you know, be successful with the hurricanes and, 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 and have them, um, you know, find success. And that's, that's all I thought about every day. And so, you know, when that time came to end, it was, it was difficult. And, and obviously, you know, for not just hockey reasons, but relationship reasons, there's so many people that become so close to you and so important to you that um, to know that you're moving on and, you know, you're only going to kind of see them in passing. It, it was tough. And, um, you know, I was pretty emotional. I remember leaving the arena that, that day of the trade and, and uh, you know, it was, it was, it was really hard, but um, you know, it was one of those things where um you just, you continue to move on and you take it step by step, day by day. And, and, um, you know, they've obviously turned the corner since, uh, since I've moved on and, and, uh, you know, they're, they're in a good spot now, which uh, makes me happy because there's obviously, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of that organization, that team holds, uh, holds definitely a piece of my heart for sure. Well, and down the road, because you still have plenty of gas in the tank. They'll be in a much better spot when number 12 is hanging in the rafters. Um, I want to, you know, as I was thinking about this, it's January 20th, uh, 2010. And uh, it was a game in Atlanta, and you became the captain. Uh, Rod became the alternate captain. And rightfully so. We, we always, you know, asked, boy, this had to be tough for a Stanley Cup winning captain and a an amazing human being like you and Rod. I remember interviewing you on the bench and you scored a hat trick in your first game as captain, but never had a chance to ask you how hard was that for you? Cause it wasn't one of these things that happens between seasons with not only your respect, but your friendship with Rod. What was that like? Uh, it was, it was hard. I mean, uh, to be honest, when, when Jim had come to, to me about, you know, the idea, I know he obviously had talked to, to Rod about it, but, um, I, uh, I, I, I was like, I was a no, I was, I was, you know, Rod was my captain. I, he, I'd want to stay on the cup, you know, following his lead. And, and, uh, I, I was, um, I understood what, you know, Jim was wanting and, uh, you know, where, where he was thinking our, our team and our group was, was headed. And um, so, you know, I understood that, but, you know, to me as, uh, you know, as a younger guy, Rod, Rod was my captain. So obviously, um, you know, I called him first and foremost right away and, um, you know, Rod, you know, couldn't have been, couldn't have made, like I said, he always knows the right thing to say and it couldn't have been a, a better conversation with him and, and kind of put it at ease to me and, um, he never changed the way he was. I never really never changed the way I was. And, and it was, uh, you know, one of those things that, um, you know, I was honored to, to be able to, um, you know, take that torch from him, um, at that time. Um, he, 
he was a tremendous captain and a tremendous player and, and, and obviously a great friend. So uh, it was tough. And, and one of those times where, um, you know, was unsure at the, at, at the moment in time and, um, you know, going through it a little uneasy. And I remember that first game I was making, I was like, I better have a good game. <laughs> my, my first game. And I was lucky to be able to get a few in, like you said, uh, that, that night. So that, uh, that helped things, but um, you know, I, I'm just, you know, w- with, with that type of move and transition, you, you need to have that, uh, that leadership and those qualities that Rod has to, to be able to make it, you know, s- smooth and, and uh, comfortable. And, and he did that for me and uh, forever grateful for sure. Very well said. Um, okay. So, you know, after the trade, you go to the Rangers, things don't go the way that you and your teammate at that point, Mark, hope they would. You've always had your shovel in hand. I know it as an unconditional friend. You're always there. But you really, you've, not to be repetitive, but you dug in. You had your shovel up in Thunder Bay after that season uh, with New York. It's remarkable. Everybody, oh, Eric Stahl, is he done? Tell me about that, uh, that time. You're still probably trying to accept you're no longer a hurricane. And now, you know, people think that you're on the other side of the hill. This is fork in the road time. You always <laughs> choose the right fork. Tell me about it. Uh, I mean, that was a tough time for sure. Because like you said, I was, um, you know, with Carolina for so long. And it had been some trying times towards the end of, uh, of my career there. And um, just, just not the t- team success that I, you know, won, hoped for every day going to the rink. And um, it, it was difficult. It, it wore, it, it wore, uh, and, and then obviously being traded to New York, it, it just didn't, um, didn't flow the way I had hoped it would go. And, and it just was a grind, um, right to the end of the year. Um, but I also knew having experienced that, that, um, I would be, we would be okay as a family and you know, with my wife, my kids, we would be okay. We would be able to, you know, move somewhere else, we'd be able to, to make it work. And, and, um, you know, whatever that would be, um, we would, we would make it happen. But, uh, that summer, um, you know, I was obviously, like you said, there was a lot of, um, am I done playing? Um, you know, what's out there for me as far as, um, offers and places to go. And, um, there was a few spots I had, I'd hoped to try and land and, and, um, I wasn't getting wowed by a bunch of teams. That's for sure. There wasn't, uh, you know, people lined up, you know, trying to show me their facilities to get me there. Um, you know, so it was one of those things that, uh, I wanted to make sure that, um, you know, my family and, and I were in the right spot and, and whenever that season did start, I was going to be pretty hungry to kind of, you know, prove to myself, but uh, not not only to myself, but to others that uh, I could still play and be effective. And, um, you know, fortunately, Chuck uh, Fletcher gave me a, an opportunity in Minnesota and it was uh, it was a good fit. It was a great uh, group and and uh, was able to rebound and, and uh, find some success and not as much as I would have hoped. Obviously, the dream of every player every year is to win a cup, but um, that uh, you know, that didn't happen, but as far as being a contributor and, and, uh, you know, getting to a, a higher level again, I was able to do that. And, um, it was a important time for me, for sure. In my career. I'll say you scored 42 <laughs> when people thought that some of the people were putting a fork in you 42. <laughs> okay. And it was one of the great, uh, uh, boy, what a, a gift it was for us that, we happened to be there when you celebrated your thousandth game. Now Jordan's the Hurricanes captain. So that was a very, very special time. Um, this seems like the right time to ask you. Um, way back when, you know, when you first came to, 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 you broke in with the Hurricanes, you were a single guy. And then you were at a restaurant called Montana's and you met this wonderful woman named Tanya Vandenbrook. My, Tanya, the most powerful moment, Eric, for me and all of the nights in Carolina of hockey fights cancer uh, was when we saw the sign of she fights for her sister, Tamara, who lost her life to cancer years ago. And just about a year ago, a wonderful guy, wonderful guy who always watched hurricanes games, your father-in-law art Vandenbrook 
he lost his life to this dreadful disease. Um, tell me about how your, your beautiful wife and the father, your bo- or the mother of your boys, how she digs in the most. Oh, I mean, uh, I mean, I could talk about uh, her and her family for, for an extended amount of time. They, they have been through so much um, as a, as, as a family and, and their, you know, commitment to each other and their commitment to, to family and to, to their faith, um, you know, has really been s- such an inspiration to me. Um, you know, my wife has been through so many ups and downs over, you know, her lifetime and, and, you know, always, uh, always is back on her feet. Um, you know, it, it's amazing to me, you know, the, the, the way that she deals with uh, difficult situations and, and how she comes out on the other side and, and uh, is always worrying about someone else or caring for someone else or, or remembering to, you know, be able to, you know, send flowers for someone else when, when in the midst of all this, she's dealing with so much grief herself. And um, you no, know, it, it, it was um, so many, you know, tough moments. Uh, cancer is a, wh- a horrible disease and, one of those things you don't ever want anybody to have to deal with. And, and uh, for her and her mom and her sister, they've had to deal with it twice and, and it's no one should ever have to do that. And, um, you know, to see them, you know, today now still the way they carry themselves and, and uh, their faith and, and their um, ability to uh, be examples and shining lights is, is, uh, is such um such an impressive thing and, and, um, someone, you know, people that, uh, love being around and, and care so much for, and, and, um, you know, it just, uh, I know that, uh, they were uh, put in my life for a reason. And I, and I thank God every day for, for Tanya and for, for my mother-in-law and that family for sure, because they mean so much and, and they're so important in my life. You are as special of a couple as I know. I guess now I know why, you know, because you got married at 10 o'clock in the morning and you didn't start the reception till six. And, you know, and I, Mike, the robe Commodore dug in, Mike, the robe Commodore dug in a few months ago because all your teammates, Ladd and Colsey and Wardo, they're all coming into the Valhalla, the, 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 the Timbers or whatever sports bar, and they don't want to booze in front of the general manager. And I'm sitting with your memory Rutherford. is phenomenal that you can even remember the name of the restaurant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've been married for 14 years. Like, it's, that's amazing. It's great. <laughs> so they're all going around the corner because it's noon. You're not starting the reception till six. And the robe Commodore shows up. Hot. He comes in hot. And he, he, he puts, he orders two Bud Lights each or Coors Lights, whatever Jimmy liked, and around his Southern Comfort shots. And Jimmy <laughs> loved it. Ricardo Curran, one of your agents, was there. Paul Kropelka, Jerry Maguire, John Adams. And I mean, we were lit by the time the reception happened. Anyways, it was, uh, it was a fun night and I, I, uh, people, people were loose and driving that night. It was, uh, it was a great experience and, uh, you know, a a night of memories for, for Ted and I, we won't forget. That's for sure. Um, speaking of Thunder Bay, um, you know, trying to remember what year you started it with your brothers the Stahl Foundation, and you have done tremendous, significant, life-changing work. What part of your foundation uh, are you most proud of so far? Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, initially for, for all of us, you know, the dream is to make the NHL and, and, and to be, you know, a player consistently there every year. And then once, you know, once we were able to do that, it was, you know, try and find a, an avenue to be able to give back um, and, and try and find uh, something that we can all do together. And, and uh, so, you know, obviously through, through tragedy of, of uh, my sister-in-law, um, you know, we, we, we felt, you know, doing, um, doing a charity that involved, you know, children and, and, and families that, that deal with cancer that we would, focus our, our efforts and raising money for that. And especially in a small town and small community of Thunder Bay, it, um, you know, there's not a lot of help in, in some of those areas with, within the hospital and uh, some of the children's facilities there. So, um, you know, we kind of 
as as family together we uh you know started the stall family foundation and and um we were um initially able to partner with uh, the mckenzie tour a canadian canadian tour event and uh for five years they they'd come to town and and we'd be the title sponsor and um kind of you know run the gamut for the whole week with different events and and different things to uh to be able to raise money uh for the local charities there and um, it was a great event. We had guys coming in from out of town to help us out and, and, uh, local, local guys. And, um, it, it's just one of those things that, you know, when it's all said and done, it's, uh, it's a cool thing to, to have this, <clears throat> I guess this, uh, this found foundation, this thing together as a family that we're able to, you know, now have, you know, funds in there to be able to give back year after year and, and, uh, you know, be impactful for, for different organizations and different charities that need it. And, um, you know, it's been fun to be able to do it together and, um, you know, it's, uh, something that I'm, um, we're very proud of for sure. Uh, you've made a profound difference and you'll continue to do so. Um, one of the guys, and he typically doesn't travel. This is how much he loves your family, Bobby Orr. He's come up for the events. Um, let tell tell the truth, GQ. I can right where right next to where I'm taping right now during the 2009 second round against Boston. I still have the voicemails saved. So he'd call me and he'd say, as a you know as a former Bruin, but he's got his guys on Carolina, including you. He's like, boy, the the guys dug in last night, Trace. Boy, did they ever com- compete. And then I didn't answer. So then he calls me ten minutes later. I still have the message. He said. Where are you, Trace? You, you must be on the can or something. Anyway, <laughs> tell the truth. Has Bobby ever called you and said, Eric, I watched the game last night. Boy, did you ever dig in. <laughs> uh, I don't know if he's ever used those, those exact words, but uh, he's called me a uh, uh, man. He, he, he watches a lot of games. He watches a lot of hockey and, and, uh, uh, you know, such a, such an unreal guy and such a luck. I'm so lucky to be able to have, you know, went through my career to this point, having someone like that influential in my life. And, um, not only me, but my whole family, my, my, my brothers, my, my parents, my, my wife, my kids, um, he's just top notch. I mean, he, uh, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of stories of, of Bobby Orr and, uh, but you know, that's, you know, the epitome of one of the greatest hockey players of all time. And he is um, the best as far as making you feel comfortable. And um, he came up to our events and literally the whole day, people will just follow him around. There'd be like a hundred people and he would just sign autographs for like, just sign and sign and sign and sign. And, and, and like, you, you'd feel so bad. He's like, he'd be like, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Like, it, like he's one of those you know, icons that he can't, he can't go anywhere without, you know, drawing that attention. And the way he handles it is, is absolutely phenomenal and, and, and you know, inspirational to watch. And, um, you know, again, another person I'm so grateful to have been lucky to, you know, partner up with and be alongside and, and learn so much from, but, um, you know, love getting a call from him and, uh, still calls me on my birthday, even this many years later. So it's, uh, super cool. And, um, you know, love the guy. He's, uh, he's a super person and, and, uh, you know, nothing but great stories about Bobby. Oh, that's great stuff. He must have to ice his uh, right hand down after all those signatures, uh, <laughs> the, the way I did between your wedding and the reception. Um, <laughs> Kevin Adams was one of your alternate captains when you won the Stanley cup in Carolina. Um, I know how comfortable, uh, and boy, how well liked you were in Minnesota. Um, you know, I, I don't think he anticipated going to Buffalo. That's for sure. Um, can you speak to um, your, your relationship and it's and friendship with Kevin for a long time, of course, the GM of the Sabres now and how that factored into uh, now the fact that you're trying to impact the type of progression and culture change and taking to the Sabres to the next level. Yeah. I mean, Kevin, Kevin was, was phenomenal to me as a young player. Um, you know, I remember, you know, when you're a young kid on a team, you're, um, you know, always, uh, you know, impacted by different people. And he was one of those guys that, you know, invited me to his house to, you know, for, for him and Stacy to, 
have, you know, cook a home cooked meal for me, you know, you know, instead of eating out every night. And, and, uh, you know, they did that on a number of occasions. I think one, one year I spent Christmas, uh, you know, at their house and, you know, I remember their daughter, Emmy opening presents and, and just hanging out. And I'm, I'm pretty sure Stacy got me a gift. I, I can't exactly remember what it was, but like, you know, one of those things, like you don't need to do that, but, but they did. Um, so they're just, you know, top notch people and just, uh, you know, people I really enjoyed being around, especially as a younger player and uh, learned a lot from, and then, you know, you know, watching him, you know, take the role of general manager in, in Buffalo. I remember messaging him right away and saying, wow, that's, that's phenomenal. Good for you. You're going to do great things. Like, I, I don't doubt it at all. Just the type of character you have and, and the type of person you are, I, I think you'll do great things. And, and then uh, I think about a month later, you know, the news of, of him trading for me, for me to, to head to Buffalo uh, was an initial shock for sure. Uh, you know, with, you know, where I'd been, like I said, settled and, and um, you know, comfortable and, and, and confident in what I was doing in Minnesota. But at the same time, um, you know, some excitement for, for a new opportunity and a new group and, and obviously being able to work, uh, you know, work with someone that I you know, have a ton of respect for and, and uh, really uh, care for. And, and um, you know, it's, uh, it's been fun to, you know, to see him obviously with, COVID and all these uh, different regulations, it's been a little bit trickier, but um, you know, it's been, uh, it's been a great, you know, time being here with them and, and um, I'm hoping, you know, we can get the return to a little bit more normalcy that we can, uh, I can see maybe some, some more of his family and, and uh, his kids I haven't seen him in a long time, but um, you know, it's, uh, it's been a fun experience. It's going to be uh, hopefully a great year for this group, take some, taking, steps in the right direction and um, I'm just uh, glad that uh, he's kind of brought me along to to be uh, be a part of it you're a winner Stanley Cup Olympic gold world championships your assessment uh, so far of uh, of your group and such a proud historic franchise like the Sabres are yeah great franchise I mean they've got such a history so many great players and and teams uh, in the past uh, you know I, I think that year in 06 if if we didn't win that game in game seven against them uh, at home, I'm, I'm for certain Buffalo was going to go on to win the Stanley Cup that year. And um, so, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a great market. I remember, you know, playing in the playoffs against them and even through the course of my career in the regular season game. It's a great market. It's a great uh, sports town and passionate. And, um, you know, there's a uh, it's it's a it's a good group, a great group of guys that are looking forward to trying to take another step. And I think, you know, there's a lot of young young guys here. It's a younger team, um, a lot different than uh, where I was the last couple of years. But um, you know, I'm getting more comfortable and confident uh, within this group every day. And you know, I, I we're only two games in. It's early, and uh, you know, these guys, a lot of them haven't played in you know ten months. So it's going to take a little time to kind of get everyone. Um, you know, together and on the same page as far as consistency with our with our team. But you know, our effort and our compete, uh, especially that second game, was was real high. And if we do that consistently, there's enough talent to to do some good things. So um, I'm going to try and do my best, help um, help be a part of it, and and uh, bring some success back because uh, it's a great market that uh, you know deserves a good team. Uh, I want to ask you about. Um... Not for you to comment if you don't want to, but just to give the State of the Union right now about um, head hits in the National Hockey League. Uh, if I was calling your first game, uh, Dowd's hit. Thankfully, you're healthy and you're okay. But he's coming through the middle, and he can just deliver through the body. Okay, You don't need to elevate. Now, I was a goaltender. Not much at one. I backed up one game in the league. But – and it, it – it, and it, the game moves so fast. I talked to Jordan about this. It looked to me like he could finish through the body. Instead of asking you to comment on the hit, I ask you to comment on the state of the union of where we are and eventually, hopefully reaching the goal of eliminating any of these hits. Where do we stand right now? Well, I mean, I think the difficult part is, is, I mean, 
the game, like, like we've said, it is so fast and things are happening so quickly that there's, there's all these split second decisions that players have to make. And I think there are moments and, and, and times within a game where you have to make the decision to, to not hit and not even put yourself in that, that, uh, you know, vulnerability of something like that happening. And I, I think sometimes that's where it becomes uh, difficult is, is those moments where guys decide, well, I'm still going to try and make a hit here. And, and then that's when you end up with a clipping or you end up with a, someone just, you know, getting someone in the head. I just think there's certain times that the decision needs to be, uh, I need to let up or, or, you know, try something different here because, because the game is going so fast and everything's happening quickly and, and, you know, there can be serious injury, but, um, you know, I think it's a work in progress. It's one of those things that um, it's going to be difficult to, to manage, but, um, you know, and I, I also think the game's changed as far as, you know, how, how guys, you know, come into the league, there's, there is less open ice hitting, there's less less of that now than there used to be. So there is a lot more guys cutting to the middle. There's a lot more cutting lateral across the blue line. There's a lot more, you know, of that happening because there isn't a, you know, a Scott Stevens or someone lowering their shoulder and just crunching in the middle. It's just doesn't happen with the speed and the amount uh, of, you know, the style of game, it's just different. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's one of those things that um, I think is, and it continue to be a work in progress, but, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, you, you, you hate to see any, any head type injuries because they're obviously scary things and, and, uh, nobody, you know, wants to deal with, uh, with that, but, um, also, you know, some of that stuff is you know, part of the game and, and the pace of the game is, 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 is high. Good stuff. And let's just hope we continue to march in the right direction and we achieve those goals. Um, as I bid you uh, adieu into the night, my dear friend, I'm going to finish with this. You know, Canada won the Olympics right in, in Salt Lake City, in Sochi, Russia. The one you won on home soil. I mean, that's the biggest for me because it's, it's on home soil with what hockey means to Canada. You came to meet the Hurricanes in Toronto. You had your gold medal, and then you and I sat next to each other can remember it vividly flying home from Toronto and you showed me, you know, you gave me the gold medal for a few minutes. Um, so with that achievement and the fact that the show is called digging in, you talked about something Marty Broder said going out to overtime against the United States. But if you could pick one moment with that group, a private moment um, that was the fork in the road for that team that eventually led to Sydney scoring in overtime, and uh, winning goal, what would it be? Uh, well, I mean, I think the the biggest thing um, in a tournament like that, the 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 number one thing about digging in is is it's such a quick tournament. You need a buy in from all these guys, and you need egos set aside. And I think that's that's the number one thing um, you know to have success in that event is is you need everyone buying in and, you know, because everyone's coming to that tournament as a first line center or a top pair D men. Um, but when you're at an event like that with that many guys, you know, everyone has to find a role and, and do it to the best of their ability. And I think that's the, the biggest thing for, for me with that group was, you know, we had our ups and downs through the round Robin. I think, uh, you know, the, the, one of the round Robin game was, was a shootout uh, win or, to, or, or loss, I think. And, and so against Switzerland, so it's, it, it was close. There was moments, but, um, but overall we, we just became more and more, um, more and more as a team. And, and, you know, like, like everybody knows, like, you know, in order to win championships, that's what you need. You need a team, you need guys buying in collectively. And I think uh, that that happened throughout that tournament and it all, you know, kind of, came into fruition right at the end and, and being able to have uh, Sid score in overtime was, you know, something that'll never be forgotten and it will go down legendary. So uh, for me to be, you know, just a part of that group and a part of that team and, um, 
you know, just to, to have that opportunity and that chance was uh, a moment in my career that uh, I'm forever grateful for and, and uh, lucky to be a part of and, and um, so much fun. So, um, you know, a, a memory for sure that uh, I'll keep for, for a long time. Team Henry and Linda, your mom and dad. It's fitting that, you know, your dad, a, a sod farmer, you know, your, your mom and dad, salt of the earth. So far in your hockey career, and hopefully for the rest of your life as a parent, husband, um, what parts of both your mom and dad do you hope most are a part of you and will always be a part of you? <laughs> Other than uh, your well, dad's hope, balding head. <laughs> I, I, I hope it's not my dad's golf game. I'll say that. But no, I, uh, you know, I, I think, I think, uh, you know, for me, just the, the, just the sacrifices that, that they've made as, as, as parents. And, um, you know, I, I know it wasn't always easy, you know, financially, um, even schedule wise, uh, for, for them growing up with four boys that everyone playing sports and hockey in school. Um, you know, it's, uh, it was difficult. And, you know, for, for me and my wife now knowing we, we've got three boys, we got three schedules, they got school. It's, it's a lot. It's, it's a full-time commitment and it's, there's a lot of sacrifice that goes along with it. And you see, you know, nowadays, you know, having, uh, you know, I'm not, not judging anybody, but like having other people, you know, do the, the rides or this and that my parents, they, they, as much as they could be there, they were there. And for me, you know, that's something that I've, you know, want and, and want to hold on to and, and be the same with, with my, my kids and my family. And, um, you know, I, I think that's so important to, you know, to have your parents there in, in moments, uh, whether it's school, whether it's sports, whether it's uh, just being able to talk to somebody. I think that was the, uh, was the biggest thing that, um, you know, I, I'm thankful for with them. And, um, you know, want to make sure that I'm, you know, continuing on with, with my kids and my family is that sacrifice and that, that, uh, willingness to, you know, to be there for, for my kids and, and, uh, the way they were for us. So, um, you no, know, it's, uh, uh, it's been a fun journey, uh, you know, over our time and, and, you know, being able to, to do what I do now for a living and, and watch them, um, you know, watch from afar. It's, uh, it's been pretty cool, but, um, you know, I know there was a ton of sacrifice, you know, by them to, to help get, uh, me and, and then obviously my brothers to, to this point in, in our lives. You've always, since I met you when you were 18 and all the countless memories since then, hopefully many more to come, you have always been Thunder Bay central. You've never lost that. And thank you for allowing me to have a friend to this point and one I will always have. As Mark gave me the golf ball, it's right over there at his wedding. T-Bay, love T-Bay. was part of the wedding gift. And he claims I crashed the wedding. Anyway, that's another story, another time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for digging in, GQ. Love you. <laughs> Thanks for having me, buddy. You're going to have to get me one of those hats or I gotta, maybe got to buy it online. Is that where I got to oh, get no, one of those no, hats? No, 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 no. Or do no, I get no, one no. for being on the I show? I texted you. You can get anything. I have, you, you like the hat. I've got a hoodie. Your old teammate who found you for the empty net or Brett Roy Hobbs Hedekin, he, he wanted a zip hoodie. And he, so we have one on there called the Hedekin and your oh, free nice. boy. Yeah. yeah. So well, you know oh, what? Yeah. I sent, I sent it to you last night. Okay. You know me, I got my faults, but I don't have alligator arms. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eric. That was, um, powerful. Um, it's terrific. I mean, I knew it would be. Uh, you were a guy at 18 years old that already got it. Did, you know, there are three kinds of people. A, people that always get it. B, people that learn a hard lesson and then they get it. C, people that never get it. You're an A. You always have been. I'm just trying to be a B, not a C. Um, what a family. Uh, what a friend. I am truly privileged and grateful that I've gotten to know not just you, but all of uh, your brothers and your mom and dad and so many people from Thunder Bay. Uh, attending the four weddings up there, <laughs> based on what all stalls stand for, I know there isn't going to be a fifth wedding because every <laughs> the, and Thunder Bay is a tough place to get to. Let me tell you. So there won't be a fifth journey there other than for uh, 
pleasurable reasons to see God's country up there because those four weddings will go the distance. Can't wait to see you. You still have a ton of gas left in the tank, but uh, to join number 17, Rob Brindamore, number two, Glenn Wesley, number 10, Ron Francis, and hopefully in close proximity, you will go up to the rafters with your number 12, with number 30, your dear friend, who we will be digging with in person very soon, Cam Ward. Uh, can't wait for that. Um, speaking of family and everything that uh, f- great families stand for, uh, the New Country Auto Group, family-owned, family-run, uh, family-started, dealerships in New York, Connecticut, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Florida, a variety of elite automotive groups. Uh, before I bid you uh, bon voyage, uh, boy, bon voyage, it's got to be in uh, French because of the huge goal on the power play that uh, Eric referenced after Rob Brindamore tied it in Game 3 in French Canada against the Montreal Canadiens. Boy, Montreal is off to an excellent start this year um, in the uh, Canadian division. Um, I encourage you, please, to rate and review our show on all audio platforms, on YouTube as well. Uh, please be honest of how we can grow and satisfy you more. Uh, and um, just to build that connection and continue to um, with us. Uh, also, digintrip.com, our merchandise is ever expanding, whether it be hats, regular truckers, hoodies, Uh, Winter hats, with and without balls, a blanket during these cold winter months, um, and I'm just scratching the surface. So uh, please check out digintrip.com. Until the very next time, uh, I ask you to remain safe in these uh, COVID times. Continue to enjoy this this wonderful early National Hockey League season. Uh, And when you look in the mirror, it's never too late. If you haven't uh, been grabbing your shovel or you let it go for a bit, uh, to start afresh. So let's all dig in until the next time I join you for another episode of the podcast. We'll talk to you and we'll see you soon. We're digging in with Trip today, yeah. Today, yeah. Today, yeah. Today, 